Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the session. My name is Joe. I'll be a moderator this morning. A couple of bits of housekeeping, and we'll get right into Jonathan's presentation. First and foremost, we want to thank everybody who participates in these virtual events, as well as our face-to-face -face events. These virtual events have been extremely successful. We appreciate your feedback, comments, and suggestions. So keep those coming to us here at Money Show. It makes us better and better and, and continues to have us bring you know great insights like Jonathan to you folks into 2022. Also, there's a chat box that'll be whether you're on your desktop, laptop, uh, phone, there's a live uh, chat box. You can send questions over during Jonathan's presentation. Don't hesitate, time permitting, we're going 30 minutes on this one. So we'll take a couple of questions at the end of the session. So don't hesitate to send those over. Uh, and with that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce to everybody, Jonathan Honig, who is the portfolio manager of the Capitalist Pig Hedge Fund. Uh, you folks probably know him a lot from TV. He's also, his first book, Greed is Good, The Capitalist Pig Guide to Investing, was published by HarperCollins. Um, he is uh, named one of Crane's 40 Under 40 and is a member of the Economic Club of Chicago, as well as a proponent of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism. With that said, it's my great pleasure to introduce to you Jonathan Honing. Jonathan, the floor is yours, sir. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. I was promised that that introduction was going to be literally 144 characters or less, but I'll... I'll... My apologies. Next I'll let time. you off the hook. And I'll, <laughs> more than anything, thank everyone for be, being here. You know, time is the biggest commodity, the most important. I'm not going to waste yours. I'll get right to it. Can, moderator, can everyone see my screen? I could see you. I could see you, but I don't see your slide. Uh, okay, I'm not sharing. Uh, hold on one second. And let's try this again. You look good right now. Just sit tight one second. There you go. Jonathan, uh, you're good to go. Go ahead, sir. All right, great. Well, let's get right to it. How to blow up your account. So despite that introduction, you might not, you might not know me. Um, you know, so I'll borrow a line from Gordon Gecko. You know, why am I listening to you? Well, I, I've, as they say, I think been around the block a few times. I actually started trading, I don't know, what is it, is 20 years ago, 30 years ago now at the Chicago Board of Trade on the floor. I opened a private investment partnership in 2000. Uh, you know it was that long ago because there's a telephone on the desk, if you can imagine. Uh, and I have had some success. In fact, unlike a lot of active managers over a 20 year period, I was actually able to beat the S&P 500. And it wasn't easy. Uh, from those early years on the floor, I've learned a lot of very difficult, read expensive lessons. I don't think I've ever stopped learning them. Jesse Livermore talks about this in his seminal book, uh, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. The game taught me the game and it didn't spare the rod while teaching. So despite all of what we're gonna talk about today, you know, to some extent, to borrow a line, I guess, from the Wizard of Oz, you know, you, we all need to learn it by our, on our own, by ourselves. You know, the hope is to kind of learn it without letting it ruin your life or ruin your portfolio. So let's get right to it. Blowing up your account. Have you ever done it? We, as I said, I think we all have at one point. No one wants to blow up his or her account. You shouldn't, if you want to lose money, you should not be trading or investing. I mean, truly go to Vegas. It will be cheaper. Go to the money show Vegas. I mean, if you want to kind of lose $10,000, it'll be cheaper to go to Vegas. You'll, at least you'll have good drinks and, and, and a lot of fun. No one wants to blow up her account, but it's amazing how often it happens. It often happens the shorter your time horizon, i.e. day traders tend to blow up their account very quickly, but even quote longer term investors oftentimes blow up their account or do serious damage. And it's not just us unsophisticated individuals, companies too, you know, major companies are seemingly blown up all the time. Some of you might remember Barings Bank, which was a major British bank was blown up by one guy on the floor of the Cymex Fuges exchange because he kept shorting the Nikkei all the way up. That was the, the story of the rogue trader, which was made into a movie. Or even, I think a little further back, there was a company called LTCM, Long-Term Capital Management, that kept increasing its size on Russian bonds and Russian bonds, the larger, even as the trade went against, went against them, they blew up as well. In fact, needed a, well, they got a, a bailout from the Federal Reserve. So no one wants to blow up his or her own account. So, Assuming that you don't, you know, yes, the title was a little bit of a tease. Assuming that you don't want to blow up her account, your account, probably makes sense to learn how do people blow up their account. And I've kind of, for purposes of you know, time here, narrowed it down to three general concepts, three basic categories, ways in which people 
ultimately blow up his or her account. Evasion, technique, and support. So we're gonna just gonna run through them, questions, et cetera. And there, there's more to them. This is just as they say, the brief overview. Let's start with evasion. Ayn Rand called it a cardinal sin. And it's true in life and it's true in investing as well. If you, if you want to, not, if you don't want to evade, if you want to avoid this cardinal sin, what do you do? Well, don't ignore reality. You know, we are traders, we are investors. We can't deal in hope, we can't deal in faith. We have to deal in reality. We have to deal in the reality as it presents it to us. It doesn't mean trading on every impulse, you know, but it doesn't, it means especially not ignoring reality. And, you know, just to use a metaphor here, if you had a pain in your chest, a couple of days, you know, it just seems to be getting worse. You wouldn't ignore it. You know, you wouldn't just say, well, yeah, what's going on, Tommy? Well, you know, work is pretty. I got this pain in my chest. You'd go to the doctor. You would say, doc, I got a pain. What's going on here? And knowing our great medical system now, and they probably have a pill that could fix you in 15 minutes. So you wouldn't ignore reality when it comes to your health. So don't ignore it in your portfolio. And you can see it just like the pain in your chest. You see it in price. Price is is reality for us qua investors. There's nothing else. I mean, we deal in a word of price. So even something as seemingly optimistic as pot stocks, I've never invested in them. I'm not long or short, but it's a good recent, as they say, rip from the headlines example. There's a lot of optimism about pot and pot stocks. A lot of these companies are bouncing off of some multi-year lows a few years back. There's consolidation, more and more uh, states are opening up. So a lot of the news is actually good. But the price action, and this is just POTX, this is an ETF of pot stocks, the price action has been just so persistently lower. I mean, it's hard to find two months in which the entire index makes a higher high. So as an investor, as someone who is not always trading, buying and selling, but looking out and trying to get a sense of what's going on in the world, when something keeps making lows, you have to say, I don't know what's going on here, but something is going on here. I, you know, I liked it at 50 or I was interested in 50 and now it's at 38. What's going on here? What is the market seeing that I don't see? And unfortunately, that's where a lot of people go wrong from reality. They say, oh, well, the market's wrong. You know, there's really great value here. Everyone's ignoring this value. So, you know, instead of the reality, when it's moving against you, when you like it at 50, it doesn't even matter if you buy it, when you think it's a good buy at 50. And it's at 38. The market is saying, at least for now, you're on the wrong track. And it makes sense. I mean, we're not gods. It's not like the minute we buy, we're interested in the sector, it just goes up from there. Sometimes you're a month too early. Sometimes you're six years too early. Um, but as long as the price action is moving contrary to your opinion, it's the market's telling you you're on the wrong track. And POTX has been a great example. I mean, it would be hard to imagine. You'd say, well, what happened to pot stocks since, since uh, the spring? Well, the index is down 15, uh, down 50% in a year that the S&P is up 20 some. So don't ignore reality and reality is price. Here's another thing about evasion. It's expensive. You know, you should be in this for the money. You're all accredited. You've all got some money. And I remember there used to be an ad for Barron's that said the difference, you know, something effective, the difference between money and wealth if you've got a million dollars, I don't remember what it is now, maybe it's two million. If you've got a couple million, my sense is you've probably worked for it. It's not easy. And frankly, a million ain't what it used to be. And evasion, if you wanna keep that, if you wanna grow that, don't evade reality. It's hella expensive, as they say. There's a lot of examples. You might say these are quote cherry picked, but you know the reality is, is that Xerox is a major US company and if you've been holding on to it with a loss, I mean, it's, it's, it's possible you've been holding on to it to a, with a 72% loss for 21 years. And it's ultimately a bad use of capital. If you read Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, he talks about the importance of always keeping your capital moving, not buying and selling, not buying and selling, but to tie up capital, precious capital in a trade for three years, five years, eight years, uh, it's it's expensive. Xerox is one example. GE is a great example. I mean, in 2000, you might not remember, but GE was like the, it was like the Apple of today. It was the buy, you know, 
I guess that's some kind of comment on Apple, but it was like kind of buy it and forget it stock. Who could have imagined? So you could, if you couldn't have imagined, the price was telling you. The price was telling you pretty early on. Um, Cisco is another example. The internet took off. Cisco now, even 20 years after, how many little bull markets have we had? It's still down 25, 25%. So don't evade reality. Don't evade reality. You can evade it. You know, you can tell yourself something else is going on. You can tell yourself, but you're not going to evade lo losing money because that's always what happens when you're irrational. It's always what happens when you believe in your story rather than the reality of markets, i.e. evade reality. There's a lot of reasons why we do it. And look, I've been there and I avoid, you know, I battle this every day. I've, of, I've often said, use the line that I don't think trading gets or investing. I don't think dealing with markets gets easier. I think you just get more wise and a little more numb, frankly. So there's a lot of reasons we do it. We don't want to feel the pain of taking loss. We still hope, you know, we have faith, if you will, that maybe things turn around. And there's that sense that if I take a loss, I'm a bad person. I'm a bad trader. You know, I'm being traded. Investing is about taking gains. So, and these are all irrational for a lot of reasons. And Rand talks about this. I'm Rand. She says, you know, basically it's a blank out. When you buy it at 50 and it goes to 40 and you keep saying, this is great, this is great, this is great. Rand says, it's, this is my interpretation. It's the pretense that nothing can come into existence if you don't identify it. If you refuse to identify it, so don't do that. Don't make that cardinal fundamental exist uh, uh, error because, you know, in my opinion, markets are the best indicator of themselves and reality that is the markets. It's open for anyone to observe. This is why I wrote the book, Price is Primary, which I hope you, all I can say is stocking stuffer. I mean, it won't fit in your stocking because it's just full of so much more information, but it can certainly go next to the stocking. And it talks exactly about this. You know, you have to respect reality. You have to have deference to it. Because when a stock keeps making one month, two month, three month, six month lows, and you think it's a good buy, it's telling you something. Reality is telling you something. Caution. The same way if you felt like, I really want to wear my Speedo today, but for weeks and weeks and weeks, it's cold and gray like it is in Chicago now. Reality, the weather is telling you, metaphysical reality is telling you something. It's not the time for you to wear your Speedo. So in the markets, you have to respect that. Don't look the other way when the market is telling you you're on the wrong track. Don't think I'm smarter, I'm more knowledgeable. You know, reality is what it is. So let's now go to technique. Because actually this is much more important ultimately. You know, you can talk about stock picking, but how you trade, how you invest, how you literally dole out the dollars in your account. And whether it's doling out it in individual trades or you know, you're wealthy people, you probably dole it out to individual money managers. This is the same thing, it's technique as well. So let's talk about technique because it's certainly probably the most prominent way people blow up their account. Every blow up, every cataclysm started, think about this, started as just a small loss. Every 40%, 50% implosion started as just like a two, Half of 1% where somebody could have said, eh, take the loss and move on. But he, he or she had to be right. They wanted to be proven right. And this is devastating technique. And we always blame someone else. Oh, it's not me. It's a Federal Reserve is, who knows what the Fed's going to do? Who knows what these hedge funds are going to do? You know, we always find some reason that our bad technique, our bad execution is someone else's fault. You know, it's hedge funds, it's, it's, oh, you know, Biden is effing everything up. Oh, the media, they're just telling a story. They want the market to go down. The Chinese, I mean, you know, that you can just make up any reason. We, you know, rich people, the elite, the, what do they say? The uh, dark meat, the, what do they call them? Black society, I forget what it is, the dark, uh, doesn't matter. We always find a reason. We're the ones who put the news, we're the, we do that. We do that with our technique. You have to let yourself know it is okay to be wrong. A big part of investing and trading and life is being wrong. I mean, that's the whole point. We're not God. We don't go through life and every choice we make is 
a good choice. It's okay to be wrong, but it's not okay. It is not okay to stay wrong and it's not okay to make it worse, to exacerbate it. And we do that through bad technique. I mean, there's a lot of ways. I mean, there's like literally, I don't know, a hundred ways, maybe 500 ways to do this, but it's just best summed up in three words by the dip. In fact, I have on my Instagram, a couple when I work out in the morning and CNBC has, you know, Kathy Wood buying the dip and this and this and this. And I, I've often posted that on my Instagram kind of saying like, buying the dip is a very bad technique. It's an easy way. I mean, it's the most common way. And I'm, maybe I'd say the only way to really blow up your account. And you know how it works, something like GE, a can't miss, an easy, uh, something you have a lot of confidence in. You know, if I liked it at 50, I should love it at 45. That's bad epistemology. And so you keep buying the dip, buying the dip. And there's something about that. The more it goes against you, the more you like it. It's like saying, again, if you went out in the Speedo once and it was really cold and you'd say, oh, it's even colder tomorrow. I want to go out in that Speedo again. It's the same thing with buying a dip. The more it goes against you, the more reality is telling you you're wrong, the more you're exposing yourself. And if it's a speedo or your money, it's expensive. Now, first of all, what is a dip? It's, it's like an emotional construct. 3% decline is a dip, is a 20% decline. So it's, we make it up in our head, dip. I mean, it's, it has no actual meaning. And in fact, I think it's dangerous because it falsely implies that whatever that decline is, is temporary. A dip, a dip is temporary. It's not, you could say X, Y, Z declined, that's true. But when you say it dipped, I think it suggests that, well, it's just a temporary thing. It's often not. I mean, look at, look at XLE energy stocks. They're still not back from their, what was it, 2015 highs, despite the huge rally in energy. And when you add on weakness, this, this is where you put the, you know, the observation with the technique. Adding on weakness is not only ignoring market price action, it's deadly technique because our capital is limited. Even us rich people with a million dollars, with two million dollars, which is, excuse my honesty, but chump change these days. When you're adding to that loser, you're putting limited capital. We all have limited capital on exactly what are the lowest probability trades. I'm not ex an expert. Peter Schiff will always tell you that gold is bullish. No offense to Peter, but it's almost like you're just going for that same little, I mean, he's bullish on gold no matter what happens. But I think you have to be respectful. I mean, when something's moving against you, why do you want to keep using our limited capital on what is technically explicitly a low probability idea? Losing trades. And that's not me shitting on whatever the trade is, you know, whatever your idea is. It's math. It is the math that you know, an 8% loss, very easy. As we said, every big loss, that are, but when you start to get into a 25% loss, 30% loss, it, the math gets impossible to recover and just less likely, it's a lower probability idea. So don't do it, big picture. And it's the same shorting on the way up as buying on the way down. If you were you know, bearish at 150, sell it at 150, but at 160 and 170, the market's telling you something. You are, you're at least too early. All right, let's go to technique. Size kills. Size kills. Remember swingers? All in, double down. I mean, that's why it's a joke, because size kills. Every asset fluctuates. There's nothing that you just buy and it goes your way. So when you start with this big position, it's just a guaranteed disaster. And if you wanna make money, you're playing for, in general, the long moves, not the short-term pops. Ayn Rand talks about this. And she wasn't an investor, but she talked about how the free market is ruled by people who are able to see and think and plan long range. So we have to apply that to us as investors as well. You wanna plant, as I say, acorns that grow into oak trees. I mean, Bitcoin is a great example. I've told my Bitcoin story before. I'm not going to tell it now. But basically, I bought a Bitcoin at $300 that turned into $60,000. So I planted an acorn and it turned into an oak tree. For me personally, the same thing was rhodium. I don't want to bore you with my tales, but I've had a few big winners over the years. 
And it wasn't because I started with a big position. So you want to plant an acorn. It's a, not a 25% or 50% or even 30 or even, I don't know, 15% position from the start. Let the market do the heavy lifting. And in fact, I talk about this. Here's a plug for the money show because there is a lot of, you know, I think pretty important stuff coming out of what we're doing here, what the money show is doing. I talk about this in how to buy a stock from, what was that, November of last year. How you buy a stock, the position size is everything. So if you want to ruin your portfolio, put 30% of your money in one trade at one time. And, you know, that will happen. Um, let's talk about the third kind of big picture, as I said, way in which I believe people blow up his or her account. Um, and again, this is not exhaustive and it's just kind of meant as an overview, categorical overview. It's support. Doesn't sound, now I know this sounds kind of cozy and a group and a, a chat where everyone's like, hey man, I'm with you. I'm a Tessa bull too. I'm, no, it's not support like that. It's, it's really the lack of support for us as traders, as investors, as individuals in the marketplace, because you know, we might commiserate with others online. I don't think you should, but it's our profit. It's our bottom line and the lack of support. And it's not from other people. What do I mean by support? Well, look, if you're going to be in this game, you have to learn to take losses. Losses are part of investing. That's just the name of the game. And it's very difficult to take a loss unless you have like some money in the bank. So it, you have to be able to take a loss, take it quickly and move on. You know, and that's, as I said, it's not a sin. It's just, it's like taking out the garbage. You know, keep in mind 60, 70, 80%. I mean, I've seen ideas that 90% of your trades are losses, but it's those one or two that makes up for all the rest. I think it's, and I talk about it in Price's Primary, it's the 80-20 rule applied to, which I think, I don't know, they say it's like a fact of nature. I, I don't know that, but it's certainly, I think, true with our investments. It's not that everything we pick is a winner, but you have one or two that are the big winners. You can build on them, and then you're able to take the losses quickly and move on. And you actually forget about them. And taking those losses, as I said, is just a lot easier with money in the bank and no debt, not worrying that, God, I need this for my mortgage payment. Now, none of you are in that position, but my sense is some of us probably have some very illiquid investments and it's very easy for something priced at 300 to be worth 275 or 220 pretty quickly, not so much stocks, but certainly real estate, art investments, crypto, things like that. So just a lot easier to take that risk with no money in the bank. And I just say it's a solid foundation. You know, this is, again, my hope is this audience has a solid foundation, but it's easy to wreck, you know, a million dollar account as well if you don't, if you take too much. So what does that mean? It's having, as I, I mean, it's having money in the bank. I mean, if you've got a million bucks, in my opinion, you don't have a million dollar portfolio. Maybe you, this is again, my opinion, it all depends on your own thing, but maybe you have a, $700,000 portfolio, but you've made a million dollars. You've made $2 million. Do you really want to put it all in, in risk assets? I certainly didn't when I had that portfolio because I needed to be able to take losses. Uh, and that was a solid foundation. Jesse Livermore talks about this, this, especially when it comes to owing money. And, you know, I think this is true with a big mortgage, certainly true with something like credit card debt. He, would, he was never able to think or trade clearly or invest clearly as long as he owed money. So don't put yourself in that position of thinking, oh, I'm gonna trade this, but you know, I really need this for the, you know, he also talks about something that you know, the market can't pay you. You know, it's not an ATM. So as long as you feel like I can't afford to take a loss, you know, you shouldn't, it's, 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 it's not that it's no support, it's like negative support. Here's another one very quickly, and I definitely wanna leave time for questions. So please put them in the chat now. You can't fight the market. I mean, there's that great line about the market can stay uh, irrational as long as you can stay solve, you know, longer than you can stay solvent. I don't think of the market as rational or irrational. It just is what it is. But the point is, you're not going to win against the market, especially when you're kind of taking out your own emotions or feelings on the market. And 
that, you know, Mr. Gecko talks about this. Don't get, don't get emotional about stock. It clouds your judgment. And that's in any way. I mean, if you're frustrated at something, if you think the world should be a certain way and it's not, take out that frustration somewhere. Take it out of the gym, take it out, take a walk, do something. Don't take it out on your brokerage account. I and mean, it's so easy. It's hard to think of the idea of your brokerage account as a loaded gun every day that you can shoot yourself in the head, but it really is. And people do it all the time. If you feel like you have to bid on something, I mean, I just bid on this collection of great Space Coaster memorabilia on eBay, and it was only $20. And it's pretty cheap and fun relative to losing a lot more of that being irrational in stocks. Oh, I'll end with this, and we just have a few minutes left. Again, so I'm gonna hear questions, but go back to this idea. I mean, I think it, it ends ultimately in terms of support where it starts with what are we doing as investors? I mean, why are we even, why are you at this conference? Iran talks about this. You know, the whole point of this is to enjoy life, is to enjoy ourselves. I mean, however old you are, my sense is you're probably older than, I don't know, 20 or 30 if you've got a couple mil, mil which is great. Um, the point is not to be right. The point is to enjoy life. It took me a long time to learn that. But this is the purpose of investing, just as Rand talks about it in life, it's the purpose of investing. It's not to be right. I mean, again, I use Peter as an example. I like him, but his whole thing is being right on gold. The point is not to be right or pontificate and argue on social media and argue with our friends. It's to enjoy our life. And you have to understand that the profit you make is your applause. You don't need validation from other people you know, the profit is in the pudding, the profit is your applause, and that's what matters. I mean, and frankly, people who invested in crypto, crypto, you know, I don't say they're laughing at us, but look, the, you know, I mean, the truth is I should have added to my crypto on the way up, but look, I made, I guess, I don't know, 50 grand doing nothing over 10 years and feels pretty good. The profit is my applause. I don't feel like I need to be right. The point is make money, use that money to live, live. Don't obsess about the markets, live. Go take a walk if you're rich, spend time on that. Go to a movie, get into movies, get into celebrating your friends, taking time for that. Go to some sporting events if it's safe and you're vaccinated. Take some money, take five grand and go buy off some gifts for your friends that love, you know, do something with your money. Don't, it doesn't have to be always about being right in the market. It's amazing how much fun you can have with $20,000 how many lives you can improve, yours or other people's, just how much fun you can have. Go see, go to a, what do they call this, an aquarium. Go find the best Bloody Marys in your town, which I love. You know, go do something with your money. It's not all about being every right with every last dollar. There, there's, there's more to life than just the markets. So find some support in that. And even in the heydays of, of the, uh, the floor trading, which I really caught the end of, Traders used to go out and buy themselves a Rolex you know, when they were really making a lot of money to get it out of the market and to have something that, are, that they really enjoyed. To do that as well. Life is too short um, and it's not very expensive to get out there and live. You don't have to be right. You just have to enjoy your life. The more that's the moral of a story. You have the, we have the power. I mean, we have the power to destroy our portfolio every day, but also to protect it and make rational choices. I think a good philosophy can help you survive even help you thrive. That's what the book is about. As I said, I think it really makes, you, you, I mean, look at the Amazon review, the top Amazon review, and it's not mine, says, I've never read an investment book like this. So makes this great stocking stuffer. I hope you'll check it out. And thank you so much for taking the time to visit with me today. I hope you found it of interest and be safe. Thank you again. Thank you, Jonathan. Great advice, really. Great presentation, great advice at the end, because it's not all about money. You got to be happy and do what you love <clears throat> and, and those around you. A couple, we have a lot of questions. You got a lot of great feedback in the room. We'll get to a couple of them quickly and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, Thomas is asking, he's saying that he's noticed traders are always trying to time tops and bottoms. What are your thoughts there? And, and, and if, if you have a trading mentality, how do you stop doing that? Yeah, I mean, Ber Bernard Baruch said it. He was a legislator, but he was also a very successful 
speculator is that the money is made in the middle 20% or excuse me, the middle 60%. You know, you can miss the top 20%. I mean, what, what most people do is that they buy it on the way down. So you, if you're sh wanting to short it, you don't have to sell the top because what usually happens is that a market corrects and everyone says, well, you know, X, whatever it is, has come down 20, 30%. I do think it's a good buy at these levels. So, you know, most people invested in tech stocks in February of 2000 and they bought all the way down. So you don't have to sell the top of a move or buy the bottom in order to make so. So in fact, when you think about it, a, a market at an all time high, that's the most bullish market you can find, you know, because the market's telling you I'm ready for new uncharted area. And think about how rich you would have been. I mean, it's always could have, should have, would have. But if you bought Bitcoin at its all time high, you know, when we talk about the all time high, it's usually just an all time high because markets trend and too easily we want to fight that trend because we want to be right. So this gentleman or this young, this lady are exactly right. Don't fight the tape. With that said, again, a lot of questions, folks. They're great questions. Uh, highly recommend Jonathan's books as part of your investment process for sure. Last question, thoughts, Jonathan, on going into 2022. What are your thoughts, generally speaking, on what you think the market brings us next year? Well, I know I'm going to Mexico. So, you know, I mean, for me, I'm, I don't remember 9-11, but, you know, I've, I'm tired of being cooped up and I've put away quite a bit of money to, enjoy my life. Um, you know, moving into the markets, I, you know, I don't feel there, there's an old saying, I don't think everything that rhymes is always true, but I still, there's a sense of when in doubt, stay out. You know, we've gone to, I think, very oversold to, you know, I, I don't see a lot for me on the long side that really interests me. I don't see a lot on the short side that really interests me. So I'm very, as a big macro investor, I'm very happy to kind of bide my time pick my spots. I've never seen short-term rates as weak. And um, look at the two-year note. I'll just say it. You know, you've gone from making two-tenths of 1% on your money to, what is it? 1% on your money in the last six weeks. So things can change pretty quickly. And I think um, I like having that liquidity and choice, given the fact that I don't see a, re a lot of real demonstrable trends in the markets writ large right now. Thank you very much, sir. We appreciate your insights. I speak for Money Show. We speak for the audience. Thank you very, very much for your insights as always. Folks, thank you for joining this session. We urge you to come see us live if you want in Las Vegas, February 24th, 25th, and 26th. We will be back live. Come visit us. Come meet the speakers. Come meet us. We're looking forward to seeing you. And again, everybody enjoy the rest of your day today. We'll keep in mind this session, these sessions are going through tomorrow evening. This is day two. We'll be ending tomorrow night, day three. So again, thank you for your feedback, comments, and suggestions. Keep those coming to us here at Money Show. It makes us better. Jonathan, thank you again, sir, for all your patronage and your support and your education. We appreciate it. You got great feedback today. Thanks again, sir. Everybody have a great day.